Hello everyone, what's up? In this first episode of Weather Your Models, I'm going to show you my process for weathering models step by step. You will see what the weathering steps are, in which order to tackle them, what products you need, and which of my weathering tutorials to watch for further information. Each step is illustrated with a 30 seconds video, so you also have a visual guide to weathering. The models featured in this video are all from the Horus Heresy range by Forgeworld. However, the techniques I will explain all originated in the world of military modeling and will apply regardless of what models you use. So, whether you are into war games, scale models, military models or all of the above, if you want to get started with weathering, this video is for you. As you can see, I have created a kind of flowchart for you. It occurred to me recently that my entire weathering process is really determined at the onset of a project by the kind of chipping that I want to use. Therefore, I have created three different pathways, each of which has several steps. But before we start, a disclaimer. As I have said twice so far, this is merely my process. There are other ways to do this, and more techniques than the ones I have chosen. However, what I can guarantee is that what I'm about to show you is not only tried and tested, but also easy to replicate by mere mortals like us. Okay, so the first decision we will have to make when starting a new project is which of the three paths to take. This is a bit like choosing a character class in D&D. In fact, I'd say it's like choosing between fighter, ranger and paladin. All three classes achieve the same goals, but they also play rather differently. But enough dorky similes. Let's have a look at the pros and cons of each chipping method. First of all, we have sponge chipping. Now, this is probably the method best suited to beginners and the one that requires the least equipment. In fact, you won't be needing either an airbrush or any specialized products for it. It's also compatible with all sorts of paints. Acrylics, enamels, lacquers, you name it. However, it's by far the least realistic and it will require a steady hand and lots of practice if you want to fill in those larger chips in order to make it look convincing. Next, we have chipping fluid, originally known as hairspray chipping. This is a technique invented by Phil Stutinskas in the early 2000s. And while it's not extremely complex, it will require more trial and error than the previous one. Other downsides are the fact that it requires an airbrush and that it doesn't work well with lacquer paints, which many of us like to use for our base coats. On the other hand, it offers great versatility as it can be used for other effects like paint fading and it can be extremely realistic as the paint will actually wear out in the process. Last but not least, we have liquid mask chipping, which is a kind of combination of the previous two. Like chipping fluid, it will require an airbrush for best results. And well, it will obviously require that you buy a liquid mask. But other than that, I don't think it has any downsides. It's realistic, it works well with all kinds of paints, and I think it's really easy to apply. My weathering tutorials cover all three methods. So I suggest you take a look and see which one you'd like to try in your next project. Now let's go back at the bigger picture and have a look at these three pathways. Of the three paths, I'm going to show you the bottom one first, liquid mask chipping, as it is the one I have used in my last two projects. What I'm going to do is to go through the entire path first and then show you only the steps in the other two methods that are unique, so as to avoid any repetition. The videos you're going to see are all short clips taken from my own tutorials, which you can find in the end screen and also in the video description. Our first step unsurprisingly perhaps, is priming. The goal at this stage is to apply a layer of primer that helps the next layers of paint to stick and to withstand the rigors of weathering. In order to achieve that, what I would stress is the importance of letting the primer not just dry, but cure. The time required will depend on the product, but 24 hours is the minimum in most cases. What you're gonna see me use in the video is a lacquer paint by Tamiya, which is not a dedicated primer, but is so tough that it can play that role very nicely. The goal of a rust undercoat is to simulate the patches of either primer or actual rust that would appear on many metal surfaces when the paint is chipped. What we'll want to create in most cases is a gradient, 
so there is some tonal variation to our undercoat. This will add a lot of visual interest to our model and is also easy to achieve. The paints you will see me use in the video are from a set of Rust Acrylics by Emo. The idea of liquid mask chipping is to create small patches where the base coat will not stick, creating actual 3D paint chips. We will achieve this by using a sponge to dab it on, focusing on edges and raised details, much as we would with dry brushing. Application is very easy, but it's crucial that you let it dry until the liquid mask becomes virtually invisible. The product that you will see me use in the video, in a few moments, is Mascal by Humbrol. The goal of base coat is to, um, well, act as the base for all subsequent steps. Now, going into details like color modulation, filters, or oil dots is simply beyond the scope of this video, so I'll keep this simple. If you can, use an airbrush. Getting light smooth coats will be much easier. Secondly, make sure to let the paint dry for a few minutes before moving on to the next stages. The paint you will see me use in the video, again, is by Tamiya. Tamiya paints are my favorite for base coating because they're extremely forgiving and easy to use. For want of a better term, I've called this step chipping with friction because, well, unlike with the chipping fluid method, there is no water involved. The goal here is to remove the liquid mask, exposing the undercoat that you applied before. The only tool you will need for this is a flat brush with hard bristles. As you will probably gather from the video, this is a very easy and enjoyable technique. The aim of a pink wash is to increase contrast. Unlike with a normal wash, this is applied in a controlled, localized manner. By using either enamels or oils, rather than acrylics, we are also able to blend the wash, removing it from unwanted areas, softening the effect, or dragging the product around so that it accumulates where we want it. The wash that you will see me use in the video is the black enamel wash from Ammo. The goal of the streaking effect technique is to simulate streaks of rust, dirt, oil, etc. that usually appear on vertical panels in different kinds of surfaces, typically on armored vehicles. The two kinds of products that I tend to use for this are either purpose-made enamels or the streaking brushers by Ammo. The one you will see me use in the video is Streaking Rust, also by Ammo of MIG.
The usual goal with pigments is to create the effect of accumulated dust, dirt or rust on various surfaces. Typical examples of these are horizontal panels, wheels or tracks on armored vehicles. The most important ingredient, in my opinion, is the pigment fixer. I highly recommend that you use an enamel-based one, such as the one by Ammo of MIG, which is the one you'll see me use in the video. Okay, so those were all the steps required to weather a model if you want to apply liquid mask chipping. Now let us move on to the middle strand as it were, which is the chipping fluid. Since most of the steps are the same, I will simply skip forward to the two steps that are unique to this pathway, namely those involving the chipping fluid itself. The usual goal with chipping fluid is to allow a previous layer of paint to be visible. Unlike with liquid mask chipping, this can look quite different depending on several factors, such as the drying times, the amount of water used, the types of paint involved, and more. It can look diffuse or even be really subtle and cause the base coat to be only faded rather than completely worn. The product that you'll see me use in the video is Ammo Worn Effects. The aim of this step, which I have dubbed chipping with water, and yes, I know that sounds really weird, is to activate the chipping fluid, thereby causing the base coat that you apply over it to degrade. The area will need to be wet first, and you can use different brushes, even stuff like interdental brushes, in order to create the chips. Okay, so now that we have seen the only differences between using liquid mask chipping on the one hand and chipping fluid on the other, let us have a look at the simplest method, sponge chipping. As you can see, the number of steps involved has been reduced from 8 to only 6. The only step that is unique to this pathway is the one which gives the method its name, that is to say, sponge chipping. The goal of sponge chipping is to simulate paint chips by stippling a different color over the base coat. A kitchen sponge and some paint is all that you will need. So guys, I hope that this visual summary of my weathering process has been useful. My next weather models video will revolve around the different weathering products available to us, which ones I prefer to use myself and why. You can find all the weathering tutorials from which I took the various clips into playlists, one for Space Marines and one for vehicles, which will appear on screen in a few seconds. If you like this sort of instructional video, subscribe now and tell your friends about the channel. And remember, in the grim darkness, of the 31st millennium, there is only weathering.